I'm Kristen, and this is the Explorer in You podcast. Now, what I've discovered after visiting five continents and some amazing places is that the greatest thing standing in your way of seeing the world is what you believe is possible. I believe that travel is for everyone on any budget, and it doesn't have to be overwhelming. So this podcast is all about unlocking the Explorer in you. You'll hear stories from people who will inspire you to set big travel goals and show you how to achieve them. Let's explore. So for the past several months, many of us have been working remotely, but remember back in March before this whole COVID nonsense, and a lot of companies were still skeptical about how productive employees could be if they weren't physically in the office every day. Well, fast forward to today, and our little social experiment has proven that people can work from anywhere. And we're seeing companies hire remote workers at an unprecedented rate. So as someone who likes to travel and wants the freedom to be able to work from anywhere, I'm super excited about this shift in attitude towards remote working. And that's why I was super excited to talk with my guest today. Becca Siegel is a blogger, content creator, and travel lifestyle writer who has lived and worked abroad extensively. She and her husband took a 10-month long around the world trip where they worked from places like Southeast Asia, South America, and the Caribbean. One of the things I appreciate about Becca's story is that she was actually skeptical about the whole work remote thing. It took some convincing by her husband, but once she actually dove in and tried it, she's now a convert and permanent remote worker and one of its biggest advocates. She's written a lot about remote work, being a digital nomad, and helps others create a remote work experience that works for them. You'll hear us talk about a program called Remote Year. It's a company that Becca and her husband used to travel and work abroad. And while the company no longer exists, I thought it was still worth hearing about because I have no doubt that the digital nomad lifestyle, work remote lifestyle, is only going to continue to grow. And that some iteration of a company like this will exist in the future. So if you're curious about how to work from anywhere in the world, pop in your earbuds and listen to today's show. Hi, Becca. Thanks for being on the show. Hi, you are so welcome. It's my pleasure. So I was wondering if we could start off by um, having you share a little bit about Half Half Travel and sort of your, your journey so far. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Half Half Travel has really taken quite the journey of its own since it began. It began as an Instagram account between me and my now husband. And when we were just first dating back in 2015 and 2016, this is kind of the long-winded story, but it's very important. Um, He, on our first or second date, Um, My husband, Dan, told me that he wanted to work abroad and travel the world for a year while working remotely. And this this would set the stage for the rest of our relationship and our story. But it started on our first or second date back in 2015. And so um, he... I like that he was honest and upfront. Yes. From the beginning. And I was into it because I was like, I mean, I sputtered out immediately. I said, oh, I used to live abroad, which I did. I lived abroad on my own from 2010 to 2012 in Shanghai, where I was teaching um, at a primary school. And I went there on my own and I like made my life there. And I came home after two years. But so I said, everyone should take a year to travel. Anyway, little did I know what would happen in the the future, the future. But um, he wound up leaving for a year only four and a half months into our relationship and we decided to try long distance. And so he was able to take his full-time job and go remote with permission from his employer to join a group of 74 other people um, on a program called Remote Year that would bring them to four continents while all working remotely on their jobs. And so knowing that he would be away for 12 months, I had to kind of set myself up to be in a long distance relationship with someone across the ocean. Um, And what really was great for our relationship that year is that we started this project called Half Half Travel, which we started on Instagram by putting photos together of us either doing the same thing or doing two 
things that made an image together, mine in New York or me on any one of the trips that I was taking with girlfriends or on my own and him in Morocco or in Spain or in Mexico or in Argentina. And so we wound up putting these photos together. We got a bunch of attention about it at the time because it was unique and it combined travel and love and everybody wanted to follow. Um, so we wound up with this Instagram following that we never really planned for. And from the Instagram, we birthed this website, which started as a travel website. And so we called it Half Half Travel travel.com where we were providing travel destinations and guides and travel gear and travel everything travel and things sort of changed this is a bit more into our story when in 2018 we decided to take our jobs at that time remotely um, and we were very lucky to be able to do that and we decided to travel indefinitely around the world as as it would kind of wherever the wind would take us. Um, and during that time, we wound up working for a remote year. And so during that time, we kind of got into this remote work and travel type of uh, theme, uh, which a lot of people call digital nomadism or you know remote workers. So our travel content morphed also into remote work. And when COVID-19 kind of hit everyone, travel stopped for a while and we went only into remote work and we turned that into work from home. So a lot of our website content, content that we've worked on in 2020 so far has been about working from home. And we hope to go back into travel sometime soon. It's great that you've been able to pivot from working in a different country to just not working in the same place where your company is, right. happens to be. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at your Instagram feed and because I've looked at it before mm -hmm. and I just wanted to like get my eyeballs on it again. It's so gorgeous. It's so cool. These like split photos that you guys have merged together. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just encourage our listeners to go check it out. There's like split coffee um, photos. There's like... Mm -hmm sunsets in two different places. I mean, you've been able to uh, merge the two places that you're in. It's just so creative. Like no one's replicated it as far as I know. So that's good. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, we try to. And we, tr if people try to make their own types of half-half images, we encourage them to tag us and to hashtag half-half travel. So if you look at the half-half travel hashtag in Instagram, you know, hashtag search, you can find lots of people who are doing the same type of thing. Um, and so it not even just during COVID, but like before we've had people from literally across the world, like Indonesia, Mexico, like all these different places who will like put like images of their hands together with their boyfriend or girlfriend somewhere else, or um, with their best friend or their sister who lives in another country and like two halves of a book that they're both reading and like very cute, heartwarming stuff. So I would encourage everyone to check that out. Yeah. Oh, fun. It sounds like it really grew into just something so much more with your travel itineraries and just being a resource and then being able to work with remote year, which I definitely want to talk about. But before we dive into that, I, I wanted to sort of back up a little bit and talk about process of getting there, yes. getting to the remote work program. Yes. So was there a, like a specific moment when you knew that you didn't want to like continue to go into the office and yeah, that you wanted to be able to work anywhere in the world? Mm -hmm. um, it's a great question. And actually it's very apropos because it was just yesterday or two days ago that Dan reminded me about how it was like pulling teeth with me, trying to get me to work remotely because I, I told myself for for years and years and years that I thrive in an office and I need to be in an office to work and I'm distracted at home and I need the commute because it gets me somewhere else and it's part of my routine and I thrive on a schedule. And all these things I told myself that aren't necessarily true based on the productivity I've had out of a corporate office and, and you know, out of Manhattan. And um, I think that's been the most eye-opening for me. And I'm really glad that Dan was able to instill these types of beliefs in, in me and help me figure that out. Um, so for me, my very unique experience was that I knew I didn't want to continue the traditional nine to five. And then Dan and I just decided to pull the trigger together with what he'll say is a lot of convincing. Um, 
And this was actually at the time where our website was growing in a way that we said, if we can just travel, we'll have more to write about. And then we can grow the website and the website will grow as we travel. And that's also kind of the, um, the risky mindset that a lot of people say when I'll just quit my job and travel and it'll work out. Well, the truth is it only works out if you really, really try. And sometimes if you have a bunch of luck. So what Dan and I did was I had had the same job for five or six years by that point. And I put a notice to leave completely saying, I'll just travel and see what happens. Um, but luckily they said, we'll take you on remote and part-time. So I was able to make my own schedule and be really flexible for the next 10 months by keeping that job, but just not being in that office. And I was very lucky that that happened to me. And Dan was at a different job by that time, whereby he said the same thing to his, it was actually his client. Um, he was working as a contractor and going into the client's office. And he said, I'm going to be remote. And they said, okay, we'll keep you part-time. So we had the same kind of like employer reaction to both of us that allowed us to just book a flight to Amsterdam. And that's where we started the next 10 months. If you have an employer who is maybe not on board or you're trying to get them, you know, to support you in your like remote work or traveling while working. What are the first steps that you would need to start down that process of working remotely? Um, how, like, how do you start those conversations and tend to, and, and try to get buy-in? Yeah, that's, it's an excellent question. I think, um, my biggest recommendation is to not have it come as a shock to your employer if it's something you plan to ask. And, you know, if you plan to ask to go remote indefinitely or remote forever, or if you're just like, look, I'm moving across the country and I'll never be able to come to the office again, but I want to keep my job. I mean, the employer can say yes or no, but I think the best way to approach it is to kind of treat it as a question first and learn about the employer's um, opinion toward it or how management sees it. And then if you plan to make a case for yourself, I would recommend using research that's been done about how remote teams are very productive or about how teams that went remote retained their productivity or case studies of employees who went remote and you know, had infinitely better results, all those types of things. And I think that um, being on remote year, being with a group of professionals who love to travel and some of who hadn't traveled very much before actually. And I can talk much more about remote year, but it was a very diverse group of people. Um, some had never worked remotely before and were figuring it out. And some had kind of brought up the case to their employers and were the first employee ever granted to try out remote um, so that they actually were like going to be either case studies or role models on their own to show mm -hmm. their employer that it was mm -hmm. possible. That was very interesting to see. I didn't plan to go back to the office, but there were a whole bunch of people in my remote year group who came from working at um, companies that said, you know, you can go remote for four months, but you better have great sales or you better have this type of numbers. And then we want you back in the office. And that was the deal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. So they kind of established goals that they had to meet while they were working remotely. Right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, for most people, they succeeded those goals. Like most wow. people had great statistics to show about their productivity while being remote. I'm sure they did. I mean, that's pretty motivating to like, if you're the one sort of helping to set that goal yeah. like or set that precedent, mm -hmm. you know, like you're going to kind of want to kill it. Kill it. <laughs> I yeah. would anyway. Right. And um, the, the hardest part is though, that you're like in Peru and you're like in Mexico and you like want to go out and eat tacos and all those things. Um, but on the other hand, it, to your, to your mindset, it can be very motivating to just be somewhere new. Like we as humans like to be somewhere new because it gives us a type of adrenaline that a lot of people turn into inspiration. Let's just jump into talking about uh, remote year and your experience. Yeah. Um, so my experience in knowing about remote year started with my husband, Dan, doing remote year or going on a remote year for 12 months, as I mentioned, only four and a half months into us dating. So I, well, for me during that time, I had to come up with like an elevator type of pitch to my family, to my friends who said, well, where's Dan? And when are you going to see him again? And what the heck is he doing? So I said, well, here, here's my, my punchline. Dan is on a trip for 12 months to 12 different cities around the world. He took his job with him. 
meaning he didn't quit and he's still doing that job. He's just doing it from 12 different cities in co-working spaces with his housing set up as part of the program. And he's with 74 other professionals from all over the world, from all walks of life who are doing the same exact thing. And they travel as a community. And um, so that was what I had to do the explaining on behalf of Dan <laughs> to people who said, you know, where's he been and when's he coming back? Um, and then my experience with remote year turned into me going on remote year as, um, well, we were very fortunate to be given this opportunity, but Dan and I were essentially hired by remote year to be social media creators. And Dan is a photographer and videographer um, in remote years, I guess, third or fourth year of existence. And we went on one of their smaller, shorter programs, which at that time was um, four months in Latin America. So we were with remote year um, as participants of a group of 25 in four cities in uh, Peru, Colombia, two cities and Mexico from September through December of 2018. That's awesome. Okay. So remote year is a, um, company that helps people to work remotely mm -hmm. and they provide a community. They pr help with housing. Do they help with visas? No, they don't. And actually to be completely clear, um, as we're recording this, uh, in October, 2008, uh, October, 2020, um, remote year was just merged with a company called Selena. So due to COVID remote year is no longer op operating, but they have merged with Selena, which is a very rapidly growing, um, very rapidly growing hostel and co-living co-working type of company and also providing a platform for people to be able to travel around the world within their Selena branded properties, which are like cool, like millennial hostels, mostly in tropical destinations in Latin America for now. Um, and a bunch of them have little co-working spaces or big co-working spaces. So you can buy in and like stay in your own room and have a week long or a month long membership to a co-working space in like, okay. you know, West coast of Mexico or Nicaragua, El Salvador, Argentina, Brazil, like all these cool places. So remote year as we knew it no longer exists, but yeah, it's like the same demographic of interest. Yeah. And I think, you know, even though remote year doesn't exist as it was, mm -hmm. I think digital nomads, I think working remotely is just going to continue to be I don't want to say a trend. I think it's going to continue to be something that people want to do so they can experience the world while they make an income. So I think we will see iterations of these types of programs in the coming years. So, so what, what does a typical day look like when you're uh, working remotely and was it ever hard to stay motivated to work? That is a great question. Um, and Honestly, okay, the way I can phrase this is my typical day varied depending on the time zone I was in. Um, and sometimes I would tell my employer that um, I was going to be online, you know, with overlapping Eastern time hours, so New York. Um, and so it, when I remember when Dan and I were in Europe, we kind of focused on working in the afternoon. So from like 1 to 6 p.m., um, I remember what was like our target, like work time, um, because that was like nine to three in the U S in New York. Um, so I remember doing that. And then when we were on remote year, um, for four months, we were in time zones that were very close to New York and to like central time, the U S. Um, so being in Lima, Medellin, Bogota, and Mexico city, we were always either, I think in the same time as the U S or one hour behind. Um, so it was really easy to like, you know, be online to communicate with colleagues in New York, if that was what we needed to do, or really just like field our own emails from working with people at home. Yeah, great experience. And then the last type of typical day we had was when Dan and I worked in Vietnam and Taiwan, where the time zone was totally flipped on the other side of the world. So we were 12 hours ahead of New York. Now looking back, it like sounds ridiculous, but at the time we would work from 9 p.m. to either midnight, 1 or 2 a.m. And so that was kind of cool because we could spend the entire day sightseeing or working out or just like drinking coffee or taking photos for our website. And then we knew at like uh, seven or 8 PM, we had to eat dinner because we had to get to our desks and get to work at 9 PM. So that was a bit of the funny part of living in those places as a digital nomad. 
Yeah. And I like how you were able to kind of make the odd time zone difference work for you. Um, like it doesn't mm-hmm. always have to be like this, oh gosh, it's yeah. a pain because you have to w- wake up early or, or later, but that it actually gave you a little more flexibility in terms of being able to explore and you were able to get your work done. Yes. And luckily we both weren't working full time at that point. It's kind of like we were dedicating half of our working hours to our website and our content and building our brand. And the other half was to these jobs that we had that were based in New York. Um, that luckily gave us like flexible hours. You know, we could like take Friday completely off if we wanted to, as long as we got everything else done during the week. So we were very lucky that we didn't have a nine to five because what that looks like when you're in East Asia is working 9 a.m. to, sorry, 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. And that can be really taxing. Wow. Yeah, that that's rough. I know you're working sort of half time, but was it ever hard to stay motivated to work? I mean, what's interesting about being remote is that you feel detached from what you know as the office and the things taking place in that office. Um, And like having maybe a feeling of missing a meeting because you were having like a travel day or like feeling left out in some really big announcement that you weren't on the call for. Um, I think what motivated us most was that our jobs helped us like have a purpose at that time in our lives. Um, And instead of just like traveling and being on the vacation that some people thought we were on, we were sitting down to like, you know, be professionals and build skills and things like that. So I would say that's what kept us motivated, like having something productive to do and not just being on a really long vacation, which can be really nice and everything, but it's also really nice to be able to support yourself while seeing the world. Right. And so it sounds like you were able to strike a balance between working and exploring Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the coolest parts. And then what tips do you have for people who want to work abroad or work remotely tips in terms of mindset and actually like physical, like tools that you'll need in terms of the mindset. I mean, what I like to tell myself or what I told myself the whole time was to stay curious And to keep exploring, even if I felt that being in four weeks was like, you know, maybe too long compared to like being two weeks somewhere else where we really feel like we had to pack it in. Um, But like really being detail oriented and exploring little nooks and crannies of a city or taking weekend trips and and just really having a big a big to do list in terms of things to experience, knowing that I wouldn't hit them all, but aiming high. Um, And then also the mindset of like staying on my goals where, you know, work kind of had to come first because if work didn't get done, then there would be some sort of issue and and the remote work trip would only be a trip. So striking a balance between that, like telling myself, you know, if I finish this project by the end of this week, then I can treat myself to whatever it is I've been wanting to do this weekend and and maybe meeting someone new or inviting someone I've just met. Um, Or, you know, I, I will allow myself to go to this event I've been invited to if I finish this, you know, professional accomplishment by then. Um, and so, and the tools that we needed, um, one of my favorite remote work tools, and I don't know if I should be mentioning hardware or software, but the website worldtimebuddy.com is a free time zone tool where you can choose up to three time zones, including your home and compare all of the times where you could potentially like have a meeting. Or for example, um, I need to arrange a call between someone in Australia and China and me working in, you know, X city, I don't know, Mexico, what's a time when we'll all be awake. So a tool like that is crucial when you are like in the midst of moving around. And also when things like daylight savings happens and things shift a bunch, um, tools like that, that really allow you to live that type of fluid kind of nomadic lifestyle and and succeed at it. Yeah, I would think that would be a great tool, something that I wouldn't have thought about. Um, Yeah, and hardware, software, I mean, any, anything, um, I mean, obviously you need your own laptop. I don't know if there's anything else. Oh, there totally is. And for this very reason, so that we didn't forget and so that we were able to share the gear that we came up with is on our website, if you go to halfhalftravel.com and you go to our remote work section and you'll see our remote work trip. So our remote work and travel packing advice, which is like, you know, pack for a trip and pack for these types of climates. But we suggest having a 13 inch laptop and we suggest having a portable um, wireless mouse, the kind that's like the size of your palm, not the big, like massive kind that'll take up space in your bag and have soundproof headphones in case you work from a cafe where there's a lot of grinding of coffee going on. And, um, 
we recommend a laptop stand where you can prop up your laptop so that you don't get like a crick in your neck. Um, and then a really slim and external keyboard that you can set up with that if you're in a co-working space. Um, and there must be other things I'm forgetting, but we have a whole list of like our expert gear that we recommend for people who want to take a remote work trip, whether it's a long weekend to like a road trip, you know, two hours from your hometown or whether you fly across the country, which I'm not going to re recommend to anyone right now, but um, people are doing it. So wherever you want to set up a home office, but away from home, we have that whole list of recommendations that are like tried and true to our experience. Perfect. And we'll um, link to that um, in our show notes. That way everyone can just quickly um, get to that list because it sounds super valuable. And then, so I'm curious, how was it to have fellow, you know, digital nomads to sort of be doing the same thing? Did it feel like you had your own tribe? Were you guys kind of separate? Or were there any like arranged outings together? Like wh what did that look like from, I guess, more of a social standpoint than a work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so first to be clear about remote year is that they welcome participants or, you know, in the past when they were operating pre-COVID, um, participants anywhere between 22 to 65. So you've got okay. this group of people. In our group, we figured out that the um, average age was just around 30, with the youngest okay. person being around 22 and the oldest being uh, early 50s. So people come from all types of professions. And our group was from all around the United States. I think one from Canada, one from Japan. Um, our The leader of our program, who was kind of like the um, organizer who like called all the shots in terms of like, assigning us housing and giving us information about our flights. She was from Australia. And then one of the people I worked with in the media team was from London. So it was very diverse in that nature. And then, as I mentioned, we were living for a month in Lima, Peru, and we were living for a month in Medellin, Colombia and in Mexico City, Mexico. So in terms of um, social like glue that held us together, there were some types of events, we would have like a monthly like goodbye event to the city that we were in. And there was also a monthly welcome event to the city we were in. And for each city that we were in, Remote Year works with um, operational staff on the ground. So locals who've been hired to be the experts in that city. And in Lima, we had our um, city manager for our city experience. And she was a, a local to Peru who spoke fluent English, but really like knew all the ins and outs of the cities and could help you if you needed something translated into Spanish if you didn't speak Spanish. And then the same thing in Medellin, Bogota, and Mexico City, we had one or two local operational staff on the ground who could help us out with our apartment. And like, if there was a problem with the, uh, I don't know, let's say your sink didn't work, someone who could, you know, be there to help you in dealing with the plumber who would be Mexican and speaking Spanish. And, and also questions like, oh, you know, I, I need a new bar to go to. I have a friend in town, someone who could give you that type of advice. So that was a really cool way to be connected locally and very socially. And then in terms of the group itself, when I was on remote year for four months, as I mentioned, our group was 25 people. And, and from that group, because it's very diverse, you know, you become friends with people very different from you. I found that opposites really attractive in that way. Um, and I also became friends with people who were similar to me, who had similar backgrounds or maybe of the same age. But I think at the end of the day, I realized the people I wanted to keep in touch with the most were people I never would have met otherwise. And that was really fulfilling because, you know, you, you're going around the world and and going to these places, but you're also sharing the experience with people you never would have socialized with at home. So that was super cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Speaking of local communities, do you feel like programs like remote work that they do benefit local communities? Did you feel like you were, obviously you were immersed, but did you feel engaged? Could you see any, that there might be any downsides? Yeah, it's an, I think there's, well, there's pros and cons to being anywhere for a short period of time. And I think most clearly the, if, if there was a downside, it would have been that we were kind of like, you know, temporary people who were there to kind of pack it all in in four weeks and then leave. So in that type of way, it, maybe it felt like we didn't have any way of having a lasting impression, but speaking to having a lasting impression, um, remote year, was great in that they organize a volunteer event or a, a few volunteer events with local communities or local communities of that city who are in need in each city we went to. And those were some of the most memorable experiences. So for example, in Lima, 
we got up early on a Sunday morning um, and kind of dug up an empty lot that was going to be a playground for children who were um, going through cancer treatments in, in the outskirts of Lima. And in Bogota, we spent two or three full days working with an amazing nonprofit called Techo, mm -hmm. which means ceiling or roof in Spanish. Um, and it's an amazing nonprofit that builds uh, one room homes for families who are on the poverty line in the outskirts of Bogota. And so we worked with a few volunteers from that organization and then about 12 people from our remote year group to successfully build a house with no machine tools in the outskirts of Bogota over, I think it was Thanksgiving weekend. So that was kind of a nice way to coincide with giving back and giving thanks. So in terms of giving back to the local communities, there was a way that that happened. Um, it wasn't all the time, but there was a way to feel like you left your mark and did something good uh, as you were living in these places. You know, a lot of people spend less time than four weeks visiting a place and, you know, they have even smaller of a interaction or experience with the place and, and the people being able to spend four weeks and then also be able, being able to support the local economy, like go to the, the coffee shop or the restaurants that are run by the community has the potential to have, you know, bigger impact than say, just going on vacation. Mm-hmm just because of the length of time, you know, and I think the people that you're able to interact with. So it definitely seems like a, a positive. And like you said, giving back um, sounds like there were those opportunities too. So what advice would you give someone who's thinking about starting a digital nomad lifestyle, working mm -hmm. remotely, they're feeling kind of nervous, like wh where should they start? If someone is nervous, I would say, well, there are a few reasons to be nervous. One you could be nervous that you want to start this type of lifestyle, but don't have the job yet, uh, a remote job or a remote client or a freelancing business. And I would say the, the way to kick that negativity and nervousness away is to have your professional setup kind of planned out. Um, and that was one of the key factors for me that worked out in my favor. It did give me purpose as I was traveling to just kind of keep working for the company I had been working at before. Um, I would say most people, the, the pain points they experience along the road when they become digital nomads, if they're not traveling already with a, you know, high paying job that is <laughs> working in their favor when the cost of travel is less than what you pay for things at home. Um, I think that money is what makes people very nervous, especially if they, they want to pursue the, the lifestyle more than the professional aspect of it. So I would say hammer out how your work is going to be, whether it's, I mean, to everyone's benefit nowadays, more companies are hiring re remote um, than ever before. And it's not looked down upon as it was in the past, meaning people aren't uh, skeptical, skeptical of remote work like they were even two and three and four years ago. So that's just been an astronomical change in the professional landscape, which I think is incredible. Um, and in terms of ner being nervous about starting a digital nomad lifestyle, there are a few different ways to do it. Meaning, um, I guess group travel is not so hot right now because we are in the middle of a pandemic like we've never seen before. But um, there are ways to travel and to alone and to and to live a social kind of life and to seek community while being a digital nomad. And so the answer to that is called co-living. And for anyone who hasn't heard of what that is, co-living is um, a type of, sometimes it's a house or um, it could just be a co-living, like, I don't know, usually they're called houses, but they're not actually houses. Um, for example, our friend who was not on our remote year trip, but a different one, and we met her through the community, owns a co-living house or co-living space, some people call it, in the Canary Islands of Spain. Um, and it's a beautiful mansion that has been converted into this communal type of living environment with an office space that overlooks like this beautiful Spanish village. Um, and yeah, and so it houses, I think, like 18 people and they're, you know, they come in and out kind of like a hotel, but some people stay for one or two or three months um, because they can work there and live and and enjoy themselves. So if you are a digital nomad who feels lost, the way to find community is to join a co-living house. And there are tons of them in like Bali and in Portugal and on the south coast of Spain. And um, there are companies like Outsite that have houses in places like Puerto Rico and wherever else. And, and you can always find one that where you like the um, environment, you can read the reviews. 
about people who have worked there and spent significant amounts of times in, in these social communities. Yeah. And I, well, what I hear you saying is that, you know, being able to work from anywhere really allows you to craft what that experience looks like for you. It, whether it's like you're saying, joining a co-living situation or doing it on your own, or um, I know we're a little bit restricted now in terms of how far we can go and what that looks like. But I think that's really the appeal to being able to work remotely or from anywhere mm -hmm. is that you get to set up what your day looks like, the, the environment, the city, um, the place that you work. Um, so I think that's the, it's a huge uh, appeal um, to a lot of people. And I think it's something that's just going to continue to, to grow, which is exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. And then, so what were some of your favorite places to work remotely? Um, are there any like cities that you just loved and could recommend or you want to tell us about? There are a top three or four. First one is Lisbon. Um, I'm a little biased because I just love Lisbon. I think it's beautiful. Um, and what I'd like to preface this list is by saying that by no way am I saying you should go this far to travel to any of these places right now. And a bunch of them probably aren't even allow allowing you as passport holders to get in their right. words. But in a perfect world, um, Lisbon is gorgeous. It is um, still, in terms of the rest of Western Europe, it's like, you know, the the place that's up and coming because it's been growing in popularity so much in the past five to 10 years compared to places like Italy and France that have been on the map for 50 to 60 to 70 years and aren't really new to anyone anymore. Um, Portugal's amazing. It's so safe. The people are wonderful. And it's a, it's a really mm -hmm. relaxing place to work remotely and just be there and exploring. Um, in Latin America, I love Medellin, Colombia and Mexico City, Mexico, because well, first of all, I, Medellin, I've been twice now, and one was on remote year, but the other time was to visit Dan while he was on remote year. Um, and so I felt like it was more home to me the second time I went there because I had already had my bearings. But what a fascinating city that also is like really welcoming to foreigners and to nomads. Um, and there's just a lot of expats and people who are there to work remotely and find community. And that's pretty cool. Um, and Mexico City is also, or was, I'm not really sure about now, but a total hub for people all around the world, um, just because it's a, a business center as it is. And then on top of that, it's pretty welcoming toward working remotely in terms of co-working spaces and cafes you can go to and um, different like cohorts of expats who regularly meet up and people who want to meet each other. Um, that's incredible. And then in Asia, um, Hanoi, Vietnam is where Dan and I spent a month. And that was amazing. It was my second time there, but I had been completely on vacation the first time I went there. And this time I was working those night shifts I mentioned. Um, and lastly, Taipei, Taiwan was where we didn't really get to work from, uh, we worked from a bunch of cafes, but during the daytime and then at night we worked from our Airbnb. Um, but that's a great city because it is so safe and the food is amazing and the people are just really polite and wonderful. Um, and safety is a big priority for me as a woman who, you know, likes exploring on her own sometimes. I don't like safety to be something that I have to worry about. So all these places are really safe and I approve them. Yeah. So I, and I'm sure listeners are taking notes about all these places and putting them in our, to be inspired by, <laughs> to continue to, you know, be hopeful about, you know, the, the time when we can actually go to these places. So um, I think it's never too early to start thinking about, oh, where am I going to go next? Even if you're not quite sure when that'll be. So <laughs> I know we'll all keep dreaming for the next year or two or three. Yes. So can you tell listeners where they can find out more about you? Actually, what are you doing right now? Like now that, you know, we're a little, a little bit grounded and what, what does life look like for you and your husband? Yeah. Okay. So first, first, where can everyone find me? Well, Instagram is half, half travel. So that's H A L F H A L F and then travel Facebook, half, half travel, Pinterest, half, half travel and Twitter, half, half travel. And you can also email me directly, which I would totally welcome at half, half travel at gmail.com. 
Um, I'd love to hear from anyone who's heard this podcast because it's always amazing to connect and share stories and tips. And then where am I right now? So I'm in Brooklyn, New York, where Dan and I live and have lived since 2017, with the exception of our 10-month remote work trip from 2018 to 2019. Um, We have set up a pretty epic home office that we both share. So since COVID, um, Dan was a bit forward thinking and insisted that we get some desks and some chairs and have it all figured out. So we actually have detailed that on our website, how to work remotely or work at home as a couple or how to share an office space at home and how to design a home office as a couple or when sharing a room with someone. Um, because these are real challenges that we have really, you know, taken time to figure out. And they've also been total works in progress because we're by no means done. Um, so we are here working remotely, working on our business, always looking for new ideas and new connections. And we just took our first trip. We got back two days ago. Um, our first trip since February. It was within New York State, but New York State just like California is very big. So we drove five hours to the Adirondack mountain range, which is near Canada and it's near Vermont. Oh, nice. Um, and we did a, a week of hiking. Oh, fun. So it was totally social distanced. Um, it's within the state of New York. So the same rules apply pretty much everywhere, like masks, sanitizing, um, everyone was like really on top of their game with sanitizing and masks. So it felt like a very safe travel experience. And our, it was our first one since since we left the country, we were in the DR in early February this year, mm-hmm. but we feel good about this trip. And we also feel good about the future of travel. That being said, because it, you know, it can be done where, you know, you can take a road trip and be on your own and you check into a hotel and you're contactless and you don't socialize with anyone else. And I think that's how we are going to beat this virus in these kind of new isolated <laughs> travel type of scenarios. Right. Yeah. I think it's just us um, reimagining what our travels look like for, um, you know, the foreseeable future. It's not that it can't happen. It's just right. how does, what does that look like now? And we just have yeah. to be nimble and evolve a little bit, um, yeah. which I think is okay. <laughs> It is okay. Yeah. We still have like really great photos from this week that we're going to be sharing. So please oh, follow exciting. us. Yeah. Check it out. Yeah. Um, um, were the leaves changing it, or? Yes. Okay. So they, we stopped in a different mountain range called the Catskills mm-hmm. on the way up there. Um, that's like the lower mountain range in the state. And that was at peak foliage. So like wow. reds, orange, yellows. Yeah. Everything is like crispy and smells great. And then in the, in the Adirondacks, it's a bit more toward Canada and the altitude is higher. So um, unfortunately it was what they call past peak, meaning some of the trees have lost their leaves already. Okay. But from, from the tops of the mountains, you couldn't really tell because you still got to see like this array of colors that kind of was like very rainbow. It's hard to describe, wow. but no regrets. And there's always next year to try it again. Yeah. And I'm sure your pictures are going to be gorgeous. Um, I, I want to ask you to tell me about one of your most joyful travel experiences. First thing that comes to mind is what I think my personal most epic travel accomplishment is, which is I, when I lived abroad on my own from 2010 to 2012, when I was 22 years old in China, um, I took a um, cross China train trip all by myself. So I took four long haul train journeys completely alone. And to this day, it's the most adventurous thing I've did. And I, uh, I've done, and I also consider it like my biggest solo travel accomplishment. Um, I took trains on my own anywhere between 10 to 16 hours, kind of sort of meeting up with friends along the way. Like I would meet, I met up with like two different friends in Beijing and then flew down to um, Guangzhou and then took a train to Hong Kong where I saw friends also. But for a whole bunch of the trip, I was completely alone and met people in hostels and did my own thing. And and it was a big, big learning experience. And in a perfect, safe COVID-free world, again, I would recommend that everyone do something like that in their lives. That does sound very, very joyful, um, being able to <laughs> just be on your own and prove something to yourself. Yeah. And um, I know that I, I've only traveled internationally by myself once, and I just mm-hmm. remember feeling how free it yes. felt that like no one knew yeah. where I was and I, I was on no one else's time frame other than my own. Yeah. Um, and 
that felt really great actually. <laughs> so yeah. And so, some people find it like addicting. I was kind of in the like, mm, well, now I've done it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, cross that um, off the list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. But it was worth it. It was worth it. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. This has been a great conversation. You're so welcome. It was my pleasure. This was so much fun. And I, I mean, for us, I hope we stay connected. And for everyone else, I would welcome hearing from them um, and looking forward to connecting with everyone. Thanks for listening to the Explorer and You podcast. Don't worry, we have a new episode every week. Subscribe so you don't miss it. And don't forget to visit explorerandyou.com for more inspiration and tips. If you want to share the love, you're welcome to send this podcast to others. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.